My former business partner, whom I will refer to as E, abruptly woke me up. Given that E was married and our relationship was strictly professional, we had booked the same room, with her taking the bed and me settling for the sofa. Can I sleep with you tonight on the sofa? She asked. In my groggy state, I couldn't help but wonder if she had become so mesmerized by me during our trip, to the extent that she would disregard her marital vows and her child for a fleeting affair. That was of course my ego speaking. She quickly clarified, the lights in my room keep flickering on and off. I suspect there may be ghosts, and I'm afraid to sleep there. Ah, I patted the sofa beside me, feel free, and promptly returned to sleep. And so, that's how we spent our first night in Mount Shasta. The next morning, we inquired at the hotel front desk about changing rooms. However, based on my intuition, I informed my ex-business partner that it was likely that every room in the hotel, as well as in all the hotels in Mount Shasta, might be haunted. I suspected that the reason for this could be attributed to some form of electromagnetic waves emitted by Mount Shasta, which attract these spirits. Contemporary psychics often refer to the mountain as the center of a powerful energy vortex, radiating vitalizing and healing energy throughout the northwestern US. It is possible that being in this location provides the spirits with strength due to the influence of these electromagnetic waves. This reason could also explain why many sacred sites exhibiting these unusual electromagnetic waves are simultaneously believed to be haunted. This incident serves as an indication of the peculiar nature of Mount Shasta. In this video, I will discuss many paranormal phenomena associated with this mountain, allowing you to draw your own conclusions on whether Mount Shasta is indeed the weirdest place on Earth. Firstly, as mentioned in a previous video, Mount Shasta is regarded as one of the Earth's chakras, specifically representing the root chakra. In human beings, the root chakra symbolizes our instinctive connection to the Earth beneath our feet, and Mount Shasta serves as the foundation of the Earth's energy system, from which all life originates. According to the Modoc Native American people, Mount Shasta held immense importance as the center of the universe. Legend has it that prior to human existence on Earth, the chief of the sky spirits became weary of the freezing air in the above world. In response, using a stone, he created an opening in the sky and brought down all the snow and ice, resulting in the formation of a magnificent mound that reached from the earth almost to the sky, giving birth to Mount Shasta. Named Skell, the chief shaped the trees, rivers, animals, and rocky hills, imbuing every aspect of the mountain with profound spiritual significance. In Mount Mazama, Oregon, the Modoc people believe in the presence of Leo, the spirit of the below world. Skell and Leo engaged in frequent battles involving boulders and lava, ultimately leading to the eruption of Mount Mazama. This catastrophic event resulted in the formation of what is now known as Crater Lake. However, despite the natural beauty of Crater Lake, the Modoc consider it to be a resting place of evil. This stands in stark contrast to their view of Mount Shasta, which is regarded as a place of light and spirituality. In the past, only medicine men or women dared to venture beyond the tree line of the mountain. It was believed to possess immense power, making it too formidable for ordinary people to explore. The mountain was said to be inhabited by numerous potentially dangerous spirits and guardians, posing harm to anyone unprepared and audacious enough to journey up its slopes. According to Modoc prophecy, when Shasta loses all its glaciers and snow, it will erupt once again. Tribal elders believe that such an eruption will lead to significant transformations and climatic changes in the world. Indian tribes such as the Karuk, Modoc, Yurok, Okwanuchu, and Winton regarded the mountain as a spiritual center, affectionately naming it Waika, meaning, Great White. These tribes utilized specific sites on Shasta for the training of medicine men and women, spiritual vision quests, and healing and guidance. Even today, on the forested slopes of the mountain, plants and other natural materials are gathered for ceremonial, medicinal, and culinary purposes. One of the most sacred sites on Mount Shasta is Panther Meadows, where purification rituals and sweat lodge ceremonies continue to be conducted annually. Unfortunately, during my visit in March, winter conditions necessitated the closure of many routes, including to Panther Meadows. I recommend visiting during the summer when all the roads are accessible. Any discussion about Mount Shasta would be incomplete without mentioning the legend of the city of Telos, a crystal city believed to be buried within the mountain and inhabited by a surviving race of people called the Lemurians. The Lemurians are said to be a peaceful pre-Atlantean race who lived on the now-submerged Pacific continent of Lemuria approximately 14,000 years ago. In the 1800s, Helen Blavatsky founded the Theosophical Society, after being exposed to an ancient text known as the Book of Zion, which was said to predate Atlantis. While studying esoteric lore in Tibet, Blavatsky developed the belief that the Lemurians were around seven feet tall, egg-laying hermaphrodites who, while not highly mentally developed, were spiritually advanced. Frederick Spencer Oliver further expanded on this belief in his book, A Dweller on Two Planets, published in 1905. 
Oliver claimed that the Lemurians shared a lineage with the Atlanteans and that those who survived the sinking of Lemuria made their way to Mount Shasta, living in secret, cavernous depths accessible only through specific and undisclosed entrance points. According to Oliver, encountering a tall, white-robed figure on Mount Shasta was a strong indication of encountering a Lemurian. These information were given to him through channeling a being called Philos the Tibetan, who had lived multiple lives as a Lemurian and an Atlantean. Philos also claimed to have reincarnated as Walter Pearson, a gold prospector who reported witnessing a massive temple inside Mount Shasta constructed from gold, silver, copper, precious ores, and priceless stones. Another prospector named J.C. Brown corroborated Pearson's account, claiming that he too saw a similar structure deep within the mountain in 1904. Inside this cave, he encountered an astonishing sight, an underground village filled with treasures, including gold, shields, and mummies, some of which were up to 10 feet meters, tall, providing evidence of an ancient giant race. Approximately 30 years later, Brown shared his extraordinary story with John C. Root, who responded by organizing an exploration team in Stockton, California. Around 80 individuals eagerly joined the team, all set to embark on the adventure. However, on the day the team was supposed to commence their journey, Brown mysteriously failed to show up, and he was never heard from or seen again. The next significant development in the Lemurian saga of Mount Shasta occurred in the 1930s when Guy Warren Ballard and his wife, Edna, created the IM activity. Ballard, who was born in Iowa and served in the U.S. military during World War I before working as a mining engineer, claimed to have encountered the Count of St. Germain, an 18th century alchemist who purportedly discovered the secrets of immortality, while hiking on Mount Shasta in 1930. During this encounter, Ballard was searching for an esoteric brotherhood, possibly connected to the one guarding the Tibetan Book of Zion, as described by Blavatsky. The enigmatic Count of St. Germain shared extensive information with Ballard about the future role of the United States in ushering in a new era for humanity, as well as knowledge of so-called ascended masters, including Jesus Christ and Mithraya. Even after the deaths of Ballard and his wife, devotees of the I Am activity continued to hold an annual event on the mountain known as the I Am Come. Pageant, dedicated to honoring the life and teachings of Jesus Christ. If not the Lemurians, there is also talk of a tribe of dwarf-like people believed to live within the center of the mountain. Alternatively, some speculate that the inhabitants may be of extraterrestrial origin, known as the Octavians. It is said that the Octavians possess magical bells and force fields, which they utilize to discourage humans from approaching their doorways into the mountain. These extraterrestrials purportedly use the summit as a point of entry into the caverns through interdimensional spacecraft, which could explain the frequent sightings of UFOs in this area. It is worth noting that lenticular clouds, the least common cloud formation in the world, are most commonly observed in Nevada and the Shasta region of California. Some theories suggest that the frequent lenticular cloud formations provide cloud cover for spacecraft to enter and exit. Another intriguing belief, rooted in Hopi legend, is the existence of a race of lizard-like people who constructed 13 underground cities along the Pacific coast in ancient times. One of these cities is believed to be deep within the vast cavernous depths of Mount Shasta. Although Bigfoot sightings span across North America, from Pennsylvania to Florida to Colorado, it is on Mount Shasta that Bigfoot has reportedly been observed levitating, disappearing, and passing through solid objects. It's no wonder Mount Shasta has become a New Age epicenter. This distinction became evident following the Harmonic Convergence of 1987 when over 5,000 spiritual individuals from around the world gathered to collectively pray and meditate for global peace. With all this weirdness, there is no reason why I shouldn't experience or see something, right? So, on my second day there, my ex-business partner and I set out in our rented car to explore the mysteries. After driving safely all the way from Reading to Shasta, I was feeling good until I reversed the car and heard a loud sound of something being hit. I got out of the car and noticed that the back of the car had become damaged, but for the life of me, I couldn't see what I could have hit to cause it. After inspecting the car, we couldn't do anything more except to continue on our planned itinerary. But that day, while driving, we received a call from the car rental company in Reading. Apparently, they were calling because my hotel had contacted them, saying that my car had taken down their mailbox and we had run away with our car. Of course, I hadn't run away, and we finally knew what we had hit. Luckily, I had bought full insurance, so I was just limited to paying for the damages of replacing the mailbox, which came up to about 100 US dollars. You may not think much of this incident, but to understand why it's significant, it was my third accident in the United States during the two times I had been there. Yes, you got that right, I am a terrible driver, and still am. Please indulge me as I share a bit of the side story of how I got into two accidents the first time I was in the USA. Years ago, during my first trip to the USA, I ended up in Miami, Florida, a city with topless beaches, pubs, and cafes. But somehow, I found it boring. To make things more interesting, I attempted to do more outrageous things. On the first day, I did yoga as the sun set over Miami Beach with a yoga teacher. 
On the second day, I found an artist who practiced Zen meditation and sat with him for two hours. But I think I went too far on the third day. On the spur of the moment, I called up a rental company and booked a car for the day. To give some background, this was probably the craziest thing I had ever done in my life, at that point in time, I have since done crazier stuffs. I had passed my driving test a year before then but hadn't driven since, not in Singapore, and certainly never in the USA, where they drive on the right side of the road, instead of the left-hand drive in Singapore. That day, I traveled nearly 330 miles to the southernmost point in continental USA, a place in the Keys, a region with beautiful coral islands and turquoise blue waters. Of course, things did not go smoothly. I accidentally dropped my camera on the floor, and it permanently malfunctioned from then onwards. When I stopped to fuel up, and also used the toilet because my kidneys were close to bursting, my left bumper ended up hitting the petrol marker, scratching it. On the way back, the lanes merged, and I was unable to switch lanes fast enough, resulting in the car behind me lightly hitting my car's back. The policeman arrived and advised us that since the damage was negligible, we should just move on or get a ticket. I learned that if someone hits you from behind, it's always the car at the back that bears the fault. When I pointed this out to the policeman, he showed his impatience and asked whether I preferred to go to court about it. So, we moved on. Ironically, my car's model was a Dodge. Finally, I reached back, hassled, stressed, but surprisingly exhilarated by the fact that I was still alive. When I told my roommate, he said in Spanish, locos. You are crazy. The next day, I decided to be honest about it and told the person at the rental company, the car is not the same. She panicked and came out to see the condition of the car, but when she saw it wasn't damaged to the extent she feared, she just looked at the scratches and said it's fine. Wow, I was let off without paying anything. And now, I have had another accident in Mount Shasta. Maybe the ghosts in our room the night before were orchestrating all of this. Fortunately, that turned out to be the only setback during the trip. At Mount Shasta City Park, we visited the headwaters of the Sacramento River. This place is spiritual, and the waters here are believed to have healing powers. Both of us had never experienced snow before, so we were enchanted by the magic of Everett Memorial Highway's Bernie Flat, where we got to see and feel the snow for the first time. We also explored other places in Mount Shasta, including Castle Crag State Park, Lake Siskiyou, McLeod Lower Falls, Dunsmere Hedge Creek Falls, and Pluto Caves. Speaking of Pluto Caves, it has been associated with the entryway to the inner earth. However, during my visit, I only met a local, though who knows, he could be an inner earth resident, who told me he was there to search for Native American arrowheads. So, no, despite my best efforts, nothing really weird happened to me, but I still think Mount Shasta is the weirdest place on earth. What do you think?